There just don't seem to be so many dictators about nowadays. Certainly not here in South America, for these are the days of the generals. In most countries, the military have got together and thrown out their strongmen. Argentina and Peru, Venezuela and the Dominican Republic, Colombia and Guatemala. They've all sent their dictators into exile to live nearer their numbered bank accounts. But not here. This is Paraguay, still firmly in the hands of the last of the hemisphere's old-style dictators. A military despot who's ruled his little-known land, sternly and absolutely, for 16 years. His Excellency General of the Armed Forces, Don Alfredo Stroessner, President of Paraguay. A man with the power of life and death, whose grip shows no signs of weakening. Who remains the last dictator. Today, the president's 58th birthday, his people wait to wish him happy returns. He's had several already, for after his takeover, they re-elected him again and again. Mainly because he was the only candidate, but also because he does satisfy their weakness for a blend of ruthless autocrat and uncle figure. He rules by habit, the rare habit here of command and his countrymen's convenient habit of obeying any order. Theirs is an improbable land with a unique zany quality, a province quite apart from the rest of the world. The president's father, one of the first German arrivals in the 1890s, married a Paraguayan girl and started a brewery. Stroessner, portly and blue-eyed with cropped hair and silk socks, still looks like a Bavarian brewer, though he's one of the most skilled dictators to have grasped and held power in an unstable continent. Now in his fourth term, for which he suspended the constitution, he'd probably win elections, even if they were free. <laughs> His people know that to get on in their remote and backward land, they've got to get in the queue, amigos, and smile. They live under a permanent state of siege, which, to comply with the elastic constitution of his militant regime, Stroessner renews every 60 days, the standard Latin American type of martial law. His army and police arrest political opponents, suppress student demonstrations and strikes. By such muscular maintenance of order, Stroessner seems to North Americans an anti-communist champion alongside wobbly Argentina and receives U.S. aid. Educated at the local military academy, the president's Germanic industry in this easy-going land earned him promotion to general at the age of 37. His mother's Spanish-Indian blood provided shrewd instinct, and he was commander-in-chief when he took over the country three years later. Neither he nor the hard-faced and watchful henchmen of his Colorado party have ever been seriously challenged. However, he must make some curious concessions, as the father provincial of the 77 Jesuit priests in Paraguay, Father Manuel Segura, explains. He has spoken to many different people, people about this, and he says that uh, there is some price you have to pay for the peace. And what is the price? And the price is to allow military people or other people, high-ranking people, to do some smuggling or sell public um, things or, you know, that sort of corruption. Uh, he knows about it. Paraguay being a small country, he knows most of uh, what's going on. But he doesn't object much because he, he has that um, philosophy. You have to pay some price. The price, 60% of the national budget for the military, which may leave social services and education a bit light, but keeps the generals happy. Like Stroessner, they're never criticized, except by this brave cleric. You know, we have so ma uh, as many generals as um, the United States of America <laughs> in our <laughs> army. Uh, and of course, you can't pay the same as they pay in America. There is a very well-known story of last year. A general brought a lorry load of uh, television sets by air. Well, he, he, he brought them by air and then loaded them in a lorry in the airport 
And when he was bringing to the center, to Asuncion, to the town, uh, the police caught him and got all the, all the, the television sets to, to the police station. Then the general went out with another lorry uh, with some soldiers armed with uh, submachine guns and got every policeman there was in the road. And when he had about 20 or 30 of them, um, he telephoned the president and said, would you change your lorry of television set for my lorry of policemen? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, well, uh, the, the president said, all right, I think this is a fair deal. And uh, so they did, and everyone was, was happy. To stop them plotting, rival generals are appointed to key commands by the president, who after all is a career soldier and knows how it's done. One day a week he summons to army headquarters his senior officers. Like schoolboys outside the head's study, they're nervous and on edge. Though should they ever organize, should they ever get in step with the rest of Latin America and decide that Stroessner no longer means progress and happiness, these are the very men who could put him out. Stroessner was commander-in-chief. He was one of them when he seized power in 1954. And what the army giveth, the army can take it away. But the president knows the form, knows how to keep them worried, and at a distance. There goes his promotion. President Stroessner is believed by his countrymen to be an honest man, though his government and his generals are known to be neither honest nor efficient. But in Paraguay today, there's only one man who matters, and he knows it. After a state visit here recently, another general, de Gaulle, tried to be helpful and sent an economic mission here to study the situation on the ground. These experts from French universities spent four or five months here and finally they submitted their report. Its conclusion was couched in the kind of language that's not often heard in these parts these days. They said, Paraguay has wasted its best opportunities in the last 10 years because of the gangsterism of high officials in the government. As you might expect, the report was not published here. Watchful political police are everywhere. Piraguet, they're called, or people with hairy feet, and they could be anyone. One Paraguayan in ten said to be a paid informer, and the Minister of Justice has admitted there are so many of them they run out of information and have to make it up. They report to the police chief, who's a general, twin brother of the mayor of Asuncion, who's also a general. And they pay special attention to foreigners, who've learned to smile nervously and say the right thing. I welcome stability, let us say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I make it a point of not discussing Paraguayan politics. <laughs> Careful cattleman Jeffrey Robertson came from Croydon 30 years ago without a penny and is now worth a couple of million. Well, as a foreigner here, I, um, I keep out of the political picture. As one Paraguayan told me, Paraguayan politics belong to the Paraguayans. And their Paraguay is a musical comedy which can turn suddenly to musical tragedy. A zany story with a sad ending, a Ruritanian unreality, like taking your harp to a party and being arrested. They keep making jokes to, about the, the government and everything else, but at the same time there is always there is a, a latent fear of the police. There is always... Um, what about uh, one hears, uh, for example, that the telephone tapping is widespread? Yes, well known. Many people know that their telephones are tapped and uh, sometimes you, you can even get the, um, 
the tapes from the from the police if you pay for them. <laughs> for instance, if you want to to follow someone, uh, you know, a friend or your wife or something like that, and then you can get your own telephone tapped and uh, then pay for the tapes. But what about uh, what about your telephone, father? Do you think that's tight? It is definitely, is definitely. It? We were told yes. As political refugees or seeking work, some 600,000 Paraguayans have left the country. That's a quarter of the population. Movement in the other direction, into the posher parts of Paraguay, is said to have included Hitler's deputy, Martin Bormann, Gestapo chief Heinrich Müller, and the doctor at the Auschwitz concentration camp, a Bavarian called Joseph Mengele, who's taken Paraguayan nationality. Inquiries about these retiring residents are not welcomed. Whatever one may think of dictatorship or of strong rule by the military, there is an excuse for seeing it as so far the only successful form of government for the peoples of Latin America and for the Paraguayans in particular. These people need a strong, despotic form of government. Faced with a choice, they fight among themselves. They only move ahead upon an order. And the man who always gives the order advances slowly from blatant dictatorship towards a kind of guided democracy. In the last election, he persuaded the Liberal Party to play at opposition, and they won more than a quarter of the seats. For the first time in 31 years, Paraguayans were offered two candidates. Martial law was lifted for 24 hours, and a newspaper permitted to attack the brutal regime. Before Stroessner, this palace had seen 32 rulers in 62 years. They came and they went, but they were always dictators. Paraguay is one of the least known nations of the world, distant, forlorn. Much of it a medieval backwater. By European standards enormous, but in this vast continent small, landlocked and suffocated by overpowering neighbours. Three times the size of England and Wales, Paraguay is only the population of the Birmingham area and, apart from Haiti, is the poorest country of the hemisphere with the lowest standard of living. A fertile, abundant, underdeveloped nation, only 4% of its land's cultivated, and you can buy it for 10 shillings an acre. A pound a week's a good wage, and a house can be built for 300 pounds. Almost all the rare modern amenities, those taken for granted in other lands, like its three surfaced roads, have been paid for by foreign money. The people have always been ruled harshly, and if their submissive qualities disqualify them from any Garden of Eden, these dictators' subjects have a deeper secret. <laughs> Paraguayans can be happy regardless. They've grown up in an unknown land, remote and primitive, with their own language and legends. As a South American Tibet, Paraguay can lurch through the centuries indifferent to the world outside. The air of magic noted by travellers can still hang over an enchanted landscape. Strangers, softened by its improbable character, are said to come here and cry twice, when they arrive and when they leave. For all its man-made faults, there remains a quality best expressed in the native Guarani. Paraguay has caavo, a sort of kindness. Bye. 
A thousand miles upriver from the Atlantic, Asuncion stands on the Rio Paraguay. For 800 miles, this broad river, the Republic's lifeline, runs through foreign territory. This 400-year-old capital has never charmed travellers. A century ago, Sir Richard Burton wrote, The streets are wretched. Every third building, from chapel to theatre, is unfinished. Over the whole affair, there's a thin varnish of civilization, but the pretensions are simply skin-deep. Drainage has not been dreamed of. Paraguayans still haven't dreamed of drains. When the rains come, pregnant buses plough along like bloated gondolas. The Foreign Office regards Paraguay as a hardship post, and our ambassador enjoys two weeks extra leave. All transport has an old world charm. The railway, built more than a century ago, has changed little, and the locomotives are collector's item. The only connection with the outer world? 938 miles of track down to Buenos Aires. And three quarters of that's inside Argentina. The tramway, Burton noted a century ago, still goes its decrepit way. Buses are individually owned, most of them by army officers. And you can tell who's the conductor. Paraguay has no income tax, no stock exchange, no traffic lights, though. Traffic in Asuncion can be fairly direct. For uh, people who are fairly regimented nationally, they show a fine sense of independence on the roads. They boast only one road sign, and, and you really could hardly call that a road sign. It's the smallest of arrows painted on a wall. And, and to make life interesting, they make it very hard to see. There's one up there, you see? That's the road sign. President Stroessner, the leader of the people, is at his desk at five o'clock every morning. And it seems to be a case of when the president's awake, nobody sleeps. Beca oh, now I'm in a one-way street, you see? Wouldn't you know? Yes, thank you. I can't happen to anybody, I'm sorry. I'm getting a, an old Paraguayan look from that lady driver. Anyhow, as I was saying, this cacophony of horns starts at five in the morning. If I can find the gears. And in Asuncion, Nobody needs an alarm. 300,000 people live here out of a population of 2 million. The original Paraguayans were Indians who spoke Guarani. They had no metal, no wheel or domestic animals, but they did have a tendency to eat strangers. The first white men, arriving here three and a half centuries ago, killed the men but bedded the women. So today, nine out of ten Paraguayans are mestizos of mixed Spanish and Indian blood who work the land, grow tobacco, and roll their own. The average income is about 35 shillings a week, and since the bulk of the budget goes to the military, each year four Paraguayan men qualify as engineers, seven as doctors, while in a land where a white skin's rare but idealized, a hundred young men become army officers. 
Young Guarani recruits, most of them illiterate, come to the big city in best denims and unaccustomed shoes to record the moment. In this martial land, the army's always required respect. Paraguayans were once forced to doff their hats to every passing soldier. And country boys, who wore no clothes at all, were obliged to wear hats so they could take them off. In Paraguay, the past not only explains the present, but seems very much part of it. For there's a remarkable consistency in the national story, in this parade of war and poverty. Century after century, the same characteristics reappear, and today's problems are much as they have been during four centuries. In 1811, the year after Argentina freed herself from Spain, Paraguay also became an independent republic. Her first dictator, José de Francia, a sinister figure who founded a fashion still popular today by declaring himself El Supremo for life. He held the country in its first homegrown grip of terror, sealed off Paraguay from the outside world, ruled absolutely for 26 years, and so set the Paraguayan pattern. No one believed El Supremo human, it was said, until he proved it by death. A lawyer called Carlos Antonio Lopez followed to become first president, welcomed foreign trade, and in 1858 employed English engineers to build South America's first railway. He sent his son to Europe to buy armaments, and young Lopez picked up not only guns, but a most remarkable mistress, Eliza Alicia Lynch, born in Cork and married at 15, who left her husband and various protectors in Paris to return with the dictator's son. This stunning adventuress became the president's lady and bore him five or six children. Though snubbed for years by older families, who usually married before their children were born, she dazzled Asuncion by her clothes, her parties, her courage. Finally, she buried Lopez along with a son on his last battlefield and returned to live in Thurlow Place, Kensington. Later, back in Paris, she completed the circle as Madame of a Brothel and died in poverty. Fifty years later, her ashes were returned to Asuncion to be placed in the hero's pantheon. But even in this dictatorial land, there were objections. So today, in a casket in the military museum, Eliza Lynch awaits her final acceptance. Her president, Francisco Solano Lopez, had ordered Paraguay's sacred college to elect him a saint. The vote was unanimous because the 23 members who said no were shot. Fanatic and megalomaniac, he plunged Paraguay into the bloodiest war in South American history, perhaps the bloodiest war the world's ever known. Egged on by Madame Lynch, Lopez decided to fight three neighbors at once, Argentina, Brazil and Uruguay. At the beginning of this insane war of the Triple Alliance, Paraguay's population was more than half a million. After five years, the surviving men numbered only 28,746. Those the enemy had not killed had been tortured and executed by their own sadistic president. Before the eyes of Eliza Lynch, Lopez, dictator at bay, was hacked to death. Paraguay, stripped of crops and cattle and 55,000 square miles of territory, was almost wiped out. People still talk of that war as though it happened yesterday. The bloodthirsty Lopez and his greedy, scheming Irish mistress are almost sanctified. The passing of time and a shortage of national heroes has ennobled them. Only Paraguayans who worship ruthless courage could honor such blundering tyrants. Other races would curse their memory for generations. Since then, poor Paraguay has languished under a parade of 34 presidents, all of them instantly forgettable, and today as anonymous as this empty land. This is the Chaco, an Indian word meaning hunting ground, and it's what Paraguay is about. Two-thirds of the whole country, an area of wilderness larger than Britain. From the air, an endless ocean of scrub.
But when you get down here and step out of the aircraft into the searing, scorching inferno, you find that there is jungle and forest, there's swamp and desert, but mainly thorn trees and giant cacti. It took Paraguay more than half a century to recover from that devastating war of Triple Alliance. And then she found herself engaged in yet another vicious and totally unnecessary war with Bolivia, the Chaco War. Bolivia wanted a river to the Atlantic. Paraguay hoped to find oil here, and by 1932, border skirmishes turned to full-scale war. A fearful place in which to fight. A parched land of dust and drought and disease, of anacondas and lungfish. An airless 110 degrees leaves you breathless, or hot winds coat the eyes. President Stroessner was a young lieutenant in this war of the green hell, as the headlines called it, but his role was so undistinguished that today the war's officially played down. The Chaco was the Paraguayan's last test of courage so far. And there's no doubt that these simple men have a great love for their land, a contempt for death, and a conviction that every one of them's equal to six enemies. They were certainly more at home than their enemies in this wilderness, for they knew which plants gave water, while the softer Bolivians down from the hills just couldn't cope with the Chaco. After three years, Paraguay won her last war, if you could call it winning, and this land had taken a hundred thousand lives. So Paraguay, the victors, were awarded 20,000 square miles of this. What a prize. The Chaco has still not been opened up. Though today there is some talk of a vast aerodrome here to cope with the supersonic airliners when they arrive, feeding all the local South American states from here. And if supersonic travel means that you've got to come to the Chaco, well, I think it's a very good argument for the return of the steam train, or perhaps even the horse. The Paraguayan character was cast in this dusty oven, today still defended against Bolivians or rebels by a handful of frontier guards without shoes or guns. The peasant army of this people of dignified poverty, ruled by a president who, it said, has three active hates. Journalists, foreign journalists, and, worst of all, English-speaking foreign journalists. A ruler who believes, as we'll see in a moment, that a liberal dictator and his Paraguay are soon parted. Swooping down upon his concerned countrymen at Itikarubi del Rosario, north of Asuncion, the presidential plane comes in to land on a grass strip. It's an anxious moment in this remote land. Earlier today, the Paraguayan Air Force flew in several plane loads of the old familiar faces from Asuncion, now lined up and waiting in the front row, ready with the right kind of welcome. President Strassner is here to inaugurate a national wheat festival, and so it seems is the entire provincial population. Inaugurations are one of his rare passions. He personally opens everything new in his country. Banks, schools, parades. As is common in Paraguayan life, scandal lies behind these smiles. 
A former Minister of Agriculture directed much of the American aid given for wheat growing to the area of his own estancia, ignoring the fact that it was the one place in Paraguay where the soil lacked calcium, where only wheat queens might flourish. But all seems forgiven, and the ceremony is observed with that blend of bored benevolence the President assumes when his people parade before him. Paraguay's most successful farmers, the only people who could tame the charco, came from Germany, Canada and Russia. These Mennonites, latter-day Jesuits, arrived in 1929 and created an ordered Germanic community in the wilderness. Today, 9,000 Mennonites ride buggies, grow beards and fear God. In their Wild West setting at Philadelphia, one half expects Gary Cooper to come loping down the main street at high noon, full of friendly persuasion. The patient, pretty family of Alonzo McBride joined an Amish colony at Wustenfelderdorf. We had some rough weather in Philadelphia to, to offset what we found out here, and we, yes. we already had the, the wind and the hot sand in Philadelphia. You see, to me, it <coughs> seems an incredibly harsh land. I mean, the searing heat uh, and the lack of water. You haven't had any rain, have you? Yeah. Something like five months. Yeah. We this seems rain. a very hard land to me. I'm surprised you don't find it so. Well, it's, it's not easy, but... Uh, it could be worse, I suppose. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. <laughs> Couldn't it, Clarence? <laughs> <laughs> if this sort of development can be made in the charco, it could be done anywhere. Oh, yeah, it could be anywhere it's cleared off. Now, have you found that living in a dictatorship, which is what Paraguay is, have you found that this has any effect upon you? I have, because you never hear from any dictates come out of Sunshine, just live like we want to, and as long as we don't get out of rule, we're not bothered by the forces of, uh, of any kind. We don't even have, I don't guess they even have a sheriff, police station, or a jailhouse in Philadelphia, as far as I know. So the peaceful Mennonites contentedly farm their small holdings while, on the good land at the other end of the agricultural scale, there are estancias bigger than counties. And six million head of cattle, earning most of Paraguay's foreign currency. Half the arable land here is owned by 145 people, men like Miguel Fano. 40 minutes flight north of Asuncion, his estancias cover 370,000 acres, and on them, 60,000 head. Just watching this parade of protein gives me a headache. Do you think there's enough of fire? <laughs> in Paraguay, the peasants eat more meat than the rich anywhere else. So you can imagine how much a landowner eats. Every asado means massive, inevitable platefuls. Don't you find that, that you get terribly fed up with eating meat all the time? I mean, it's delicious, but uh, um, meat, 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 isn't it? Well, if it's beef, I never get fed up with it. After, what, 30 years in Paraguay? Yes. Well, I guess I can go on eating for another 30 years, too. Chicken you can get tired off, fish you can tie it off, but really beef. Now this water is straight out of the river. Straight out of the river, yes. Is that a good idea? Well, it's um... It means you've got plenty. <laughs> <laughs> Have a run out of it. And uh, of course we're drinking mixed with whiskey, you know. Yeah, that's all right. Oh, that's... The whiskey is the best idea. only to, to sterilize the water. <laughs> Yeah, when you look at it, it doesn't look very hygienic, that river, actually. To well, be polite. Well, they don't have the same habit here as the Indians have. No bodies, no bodies. No bodies. No. Ah. Mm. The, uh, well, the animal life in the, in the water here is, 
If it's not there with purified water, you don't feel the same the next day. No. Well, it's quite, quite characterless, certainly, yeah. the yeah. Yeah. pure water. Mm. It hasn't got that zing. No, mm. oh, that's right. I think most of the people thrive on it. How about the foreigners? Well, I find that foreigners who come here with a very sort of delicate tummy, the first few days they're liable to get a deli belly or something similar, you know. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> The thing that one notices when seeing the kind of thing we've seen today is that Paraguay could be the sort of pantry of the world, if it were, intensively developed. I mean, it's such a rich land. It's not a bread basket, it's a meat basket of the world. The world is hungry for animal protein. Every year the price of animal protein in Paraguay drops and drops and drops and drops. Where are we going? Now, why does it drop? I don't understand that. It cost me, to get my steak in London, cost me more and more and more all the time. I don't know. Well, basically, to risk upsetting some people, meat like oil is in the hands of the big three. It's a, meat marketing is a monopoly, and I'm sorry, there's nothing you can do about it. You live with it. And with the big three? I'm not sure if they're next. You're being tactful now. You mean companies, do you? Or yes, no, in the world, people. Three companies. Three companies. The other thing is that President Stroessner limits the export of beef, does he not? That's mm. only theoretical. Is it? Just yeah, mention the president's right. name in Paraguay and you've laid on them a real conversation killer. Until someone comes up with a party line. Any legal steps that the president may have taken has been nothing more than a confirmation of what is the economic setup here. Well, he's making sure that stomachs are full in Paraguay. That's the first thing he's doing. Hmm. I think so. I think that it's merely a precautionary measure. Now, every one of these establishments has got a strip like this one. I see somebody's just dropping in now. Uh, no, practically everyone, yes, has got an airstrip here. Hmm. This is the only means of communication. The only means, really. Does he know he's late for lunch? Oh, he's probably had his lunch. In the vast emptiness of Paraguay, aircraft are almost as vital to the cattle industry as they are to another type of business which flourishes here as nowhere else in the world. Smuggling. For once able to cash in on its central landlocked position, Paraguay is the South American distribution center for black market scotch and American cigarettes. Such contraband known here, concisely, as goods in transit. It's the most rewarding business of all, though you've got to know when to stop. There are two different, absolutely different kinds of smuggling. Smuggling into Paraguay, and that's done openly, as I say, uh, very often with the, with the cooperation of the customs officials. Uh, and then there is the smuggling done into Paraguay, uh, then to take the, the, the things to Argentina or Brazil. Uh, as you know, Paraguay was declared the highest consumer of American cigarettes in the world. <laughs> and there are only 1,800,000 one, uh, 1, uh, people. The goods arrive from abroad at Asuncion's President Stroessner Airport, and here they pay an official government tax of $4, 32 shillings, on every 5,000 cigarettes. And one aircraft carries millions. They've come, legally and openly, on scheduled cargo flights, but from here on, they're contraband, unofficially controlled by the military, a sort of general's perk. They're transferred to a remarkable and unmarked fleet, from biplanes, which pilots fly in sweatshirts and sneakers to keep the weight down, right up to elderly airliners. At night, they take off anonymously. There are no flight plans for these deliveries. Fortunes are being made by the organizers and the crews. They land on secret airstrips, on roads, in fields deep in the Argentine and Brazil. 
and unload. Such flying's dangerous, but so is just talking about these smuggling fleets. Well, they vary enormously from very small aircraft which carry something like 20 cases of cigarettes, 200,000 cigarettes in total, to larger aircraft of the Curtis type which carry 400 cases of cigarettes, which is 4 million cigarettes. Now, there's a, there's a constellation down at the airport, I see. Was this one of the aircraft you? Well, uh, they are used occasionally, but... Big uh, four-engine job. Yes, yeah, a big four-engine constellation, super constellations. They are used occasionally, but they're uh, risky because the weather has to be extremely good because they need a very good uh, runway to land when fully loaded. Constellation can take 900 cases. How many cigarettes is that? That's nine million. What about the new style of shipbreakers? Aren't sometimes planes lured in by false landing lights and that kind of thing? Uh, well, I've never heard of that. I've heard of uh, an aeroplane mistaking the landing lights and landing on top of another aeroplane because it's missed its, yeah. <laughs> its right connections. Now, what are the crew, what do the pilots get for this very dangerous work? It depends slightly on the size of the aircraft, but on a good size aircraft, a pilot would make up to $1,000 for a flight to Buenos Aires and back from here. How is it that uh, they don't make any attempt to stop it here? This is because the authorities are, are making so much money out of it, is it? That uh, Strassner, for example, is doing so well out of it that he wouldn't want it stopped. Well, in a way, yes, the government of Paraguay uh, relies to a certain extent on gaining revenue from the transit taxes collected uh, for cigarettes and whiskey, which incidentally falls into the same category. The Air Force is supported by such revenue, as seems only fair, and so in this irregular land is the Paraguayan Navy. They have some ships, small ships for our river, and uh, because they say, because the, the commission was larger if the ships were larger too, then they ordered the ships to be built a bit uh, deeper and larger than uh, our river could take. <laughs> so now we have four or five excellent ships, new, quite modern, very well built in Spain, and they can navigate only four or five months in the year because there is not enough water for the rest of the year to, to, to take the the ships. And they say the only, the only reason was that the commission for the people involved in that uh, operation was um, bigger. Was there no uh, protest against this? It seems there, was, there was a protest and uh, one of the highest officials in the, in the merchant uh, navy here was um, expelled as a result of the, of the protest because he protested. So, so he was expelled for protesting? For protesting. Not for, not for no. taking the commission? No, not for taking the commission. Well, what he was expelled by the man who took the commission. <laughs> Despite Paraguay's poverty, her currency, the Guarani, has remained for the years of Stroessner's reign the most stable of South America. It's been pegged at 126 to the dollar. And even today, you can only get uh, about another six on the black market. So for eight shillings, you earn yourself an extra fourpence halfpenny, and it's hardly worth it. The Guarani is known as the little dollar. And indeed, in shape, size, and color, it is exactly like a greenback. These notes are printed in England, uh, expensively printed. The color is good. The feel is good. It really does feel like money. And yet, it's typical of this rather bonkers country that these notes, these expensively produced notes, are worth, how much do you think? I um, don't wish to be any ruder than I normally am, but I would be as happy to have my money in Guanese as in Sterling at the present time. Roy Gallagher, the New Zealander directing the World Bank Cattle Development Project here, has already handed out £6 million to Paraguayan farmers and has another £3 million to give away. So they love him, but the feeling's mutual. When I see what is happening to my own country, through a, a weak government who has no policy and is somewhat lacking in ability to take decisions uh, and what is happening to this one is going downhill very quickly and the other is going up very quickly 
democracy is a vastly overrated commodity <laughs> if you want efficiency. But surely no one's ever accused Paraguay of being efficient. No, but if you have a look at what has, it has accomplished uh, in, in the last five years, or the last ten years, give it, because eleven years ago there was nothing. Certainly the Paraguayans are very courteous, but I'm finding dealing with them, trying to get them to do things on time, is an absolutely hair-tearing operation. Well, this is so, um, and um, there are probably less ulcers here than there are in some other countries of the world. You they give them to other people, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, it's a matter of how you do things. You do things in a slightly different way, but you can get things done. And how? Well, it's knowing when somebody means what he says. You see, one of the, th one of the most <laughs> exasperating things pe here is, uh, you, for instance, I take my car to the garage, and the man there says, when do you want it? And uh, if I am silly, and if I was most people, I would say, I want it tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, please. And he said, I will deliver it to your house. Nothing happens. <laughs> His philosophy is quite different. He knows perfectly well that he cannot fix your car. He cannot even touch your car because he's too busy. But if he told you that, you would feel that he didn't want to help you. And you would be unhappy in the meantime. Whereas if he tells you 10 o'clock tomorrow, you are happy until 10 o'clock instead of being worried. And so it goes on. I now avoid this somewhat exasperating experience by saying, no, to me it is not important. When can you do it? No, no, when do you want it, senor? No, no, to me it's not important. And he said, 3.30 on Thursday. And 99% of the time you will get it, 3.30 on Thursday. I see. Bit of bias for Monday? Certainly. Paraguay is deep in the manana business. The Latin symbol of success is the well-filled waiting room. In ante-rooms and corridors all over South America, supplicants wait upon Mr. Bigger Than They Are, who establishes his position, his importance, his virility by the length of time he keeps them hanging about. The only really busy man in Paraguay has ample justification for making people wait, and he does for hours, before they reach that regulation weakness of all dictators, his vast office desk. On two mornings a month, President Stroessner's open to the public. Delegations, people with problems, admirers with gifts, school children with invitations. He's the automatic godfather of every seventh child. They all wait upon him for a handshake, a bland and thoughtful smile, and a mucho gusto. Audiences start at 6 a.m., so, with the statutory wait, a meeting with the president means getting up at 3.30 a.m., and it's a long haul until siesta time. I've seen and talked to President Stroessner a number of times. Or perhaps I should say I've seen and listened to President Stroessner a number of times. He does rather tend to hold the stage, he doesn't listen easily, and he's not a man who gets asked many questions. When he heard my questions, he retreated rather smartly behind the language barrier and asked that they be written out for him. This was done, he then considered them very carefully and wrote out his replies. Here they are. Well. It's not the way we usually do business, but he is the dictator around here. Like many statesmen and politicians in many other lands with which we're all familiar, General Stroessner has mastered the art of saying nothing at some considerable length and with very great emphasis. The president is usually described abroad, at any rate, as the last strong man, the last dictator of Latin America. Um, to what form of government does he think the Paraguayan character is best suited? And he replied, The idea of a strong man to which Europeans refer is disparaging and unbecoming. The history of mankind was not made by weak men. Europe, in this sense, acts as a universal teacher. It would be absurd that a strong and virile nation like Paraguay should have weak leaders with poor ideas. There's no need to state that my nation's inclination is towards traditional democracy. That is why I have expressed more than once that democracy without patriotism does not interest us. Does the president see any possibility in the future that the electorate of Paraguay may decide upon a change of government? 
I think it's unlikely. And he also thinks so, because he said, the people of Paraguay will not change their route or conduct as long as they're governed by a political party that will never fail the hopes which the whole nation has bestowed upon them. So much for that. Paraguay, I reminded him, has been in a state of emergency for 32 years. Uh, it's renewed constitutionally every 60 days. And I asked the president what or who he was frightened of. And he said, the state of siege in some areas of my country does not mean the suppression of liberties or civil rights. It is only a means by which the government keeps order, justice and peace. Paraguay is a Catholic country and so is the president, according to the constitution and according to his people. Today come to visit their dead on stepladders. When Stroessner came to power in 54, Catholic liberals supported him, but his prison conditions and executions changed their attitude. He said he'll never follow his fallen friend, Perron of Argentina, and attack the church directly. But now the church criticizes him, and last September, 12 Paraguayan bishops, condemning his totalitarian absolutism, upset his ruling party. Sometimes they are very small things they are afraid of. For instance, I, I remember a priest was riding a bus, a few weeks ago and um, they were listening to some music on the wireless set of the bus and then the music changed into a political uh, talk by the president or some, someone else and then he asked the driver to change the, the station say could we have some more music instead of that and the driver said sorry father it is impossible because uh, all the stations are in chain on a network on a network and then uh, that priest remarked, uh, well, what is in change, change is this country. <laughs> and uh, they didn't seem to like that. Uh, the Minister of the Interior was told of that remark in, in a public pass. Uh, and then the president said that some of our priests here were like red fish swimming in holy water. There can't, of course, be many communist Catholics. No, they, <laughs> they aren't. <laughs> Well, but as you know, everywhere now in Latin America, everyone who doesn't agree with the government, particularly with the military government, is called a communist. Communist. Uh, particularly if you talk about changes in, in social order or justice. And then after that, they, they tried to, to make me to, to send one or two priests away. Why was back that? to back to Spain or or to some other country. Well, they didn't like their preaching on that uh, on that um, subject. Did you send them away? I didn't. I didn't. No, I, I won't uh, unless uh, there is a, a judgment and uh, there is a a, a law suit and uh, everything is done according to the law. I mean. In the past, the press of Asuncion has never been free, free as we understand a free press. I don't think anything has definitely been laid down, but the journalists and cameramen here just knew what was good for them, knew what not to do. One photographer who didn't know what not to do was a television cameraman recently who took some footage of a strike. And this was seen in the United States. Now, he was promptly thrown into jail. No charge was preferred against him. He was thrown into jail and a scare was thrown into him. So he'll know what to photograph in future. In the paper today, there are 18 photographs. 16 of them are of President Stresner. The other two are of footballers. As I said, the journalists here know what's good for them. Because he compromises the future, even a good dictator can be bad. Even a candidate for peace and progress who offers no ideological justification for wielding power. President Stroessner is no Hitler, no spellbinder, though neither is he a bloodthirsty fanatic. He just believes stability only follows strong one-man rule, his rule. He may be an old-fashioned ruthless despot who takes care no opposition, no 
heir apparent is in sight, but it's just possible when he does go, he'll be the first in poor Paraguay's parade of bloodthirsty rulers to leave behind some achievement. A legacy from the dictator who tamed the generals. <laughs>